Welcome to Beta Session 8, What About the Trinity? Now, again, very few people actually ask the question, what about the Trinity? They ask questions related to the Trinitarian nature of God. Now, we talked about science last week, and when we talked about that, we talked about essentials versus non-essentials of the faith. Well, in the Greek, Paul actually once refers to the non-essentials of the faith, and he uses the word in the Greek, adiaphora. Now, that's a good word for us to talk about for a moment. Adiaphora are those things that are not essential. Now, they matter because all truth matters to God, but they're not essentials. Our faith does not rest on adiaphora. There are a lot of things in, in life that are adiaphora. They don't really matter that much, but we spend a lot of time arguing about them. The Trinity is not adiaphora. The Trinity really does matter. It's really, really important because the nature of God is an essential of the faith. Who is God? What is God like? That's critically important, and we need to get that right. Now, in Deuteronomy 6 verse 4, we find these words, and this is a very important part of Judaism even today. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It's part of the Shema, and devout Jewish people quote that in prayer every single day. And the earliest Christians were all Jewish people, and so they knew the Lord our God, the Lord is one. They believed in one God. They were monotheists. And in a sense, Judaism is the beginning of monotheism, and that was a part of Christianity. So somehow we go from being monotheist to triunitarians, trinitarians. The idea of trinity is not even found in the Bible, and yet Christians have embraced this for 2,000 years. So where did the idea of trinity come from? Well, first we believe God is one. That has never changed. The earliest Christians were convinced there's only one God. But they also believed in his tri-unity, that God is somehow three in one. Where did this concept come from? The reality is that this is one essential that all Orthodox historic Christians have agreed on for 2,000 years, regardless of whether they're Episcopalian or Lutheran or Methodist or Baptist or Assembly of God or non-denominational. All historic Orthodox Christians embrace the idea of the Trinity. And it, that word, if it's not in the Bible, where did that concept come from? Well, first of all, it came from two historical events that changed the church forever. The first of those two events is the death and resurrection of Jesus. When Jesus died and then rose again, the earliest Christians who all recognized God as one had to rethink how they view God and how they view Jesus. The second big event was the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost in the book of Acts. When the Holy Spirit showed up, they had to rethink again how they saw God and how they saw the Holy Spirit. They had to do some deep thinking. And that comes out <clears throat> in some of the earliest Trinitarian formulas in the Bible. Let me explain three of them to you. The first one's found in Matthew 28, verse 19. Here, Jesus himself says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the first one to use a Trinitarian formula in the New Testament. And he's referring to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all together as equals. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18, the Apostle Paul says, For through Jesus, that is the Son, we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. So the Son, the Father, and the Spirit are all mentioned in Ephesians 2, 18. And then the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 refers to the Trinity this way. He says to God's elect, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ. So we had those two significant events, the death and resurrection of Jesus and the coming of the Holy Spirit. And then we have these Trinitarian formulas from Jesus and from Paul and from Peter. So early on, the church began to rethink how they understood God, and they recognized that there is one God in three separate but equal persons. Now, that's a radical idea, and it's such a radical idea that people often misunderstood and got confused because it's a paradox. Now, there are a lot of paradoxes in Christianity. 
Here's one. Jesus is fully human and fully divine. Well, well how's that possible? You can't be 200% of something. You can only be 100% of something. Jesus is 100% divine, 100% human. That's mathematically impossible. It's, it's a paradox. We believe both things are true at the same time, even though mathematically it can't happen. The Trinity is a lot like that. We believe there's only one God, not two gods, not three gods, just one God. And yet there are three separate but equal persons. That is mind-blowing. It's a paradox. And Christians often misunderstand this. Augustine early on wrote a book called The Trinity. It's about this thick. I've never made my way all the way through it. It's really deep. And the more I read it, the more I have to stop and go, wow, that blows my mind. It's really heavy. And it's easy for Christians to get confused. And all of the early creeds in the church developed because Christians started misunderstanding this concept. And here's why. We hate paradoxes. And what we try to do with the paradox is we try to take the impossibility out of the paradox. We try to explain paradoxes. We try to make paradoxes make sense. Like the Coptic Christians years ago who said, well, God is half, Jesus is half human and half divine and, and the part of him that's divine is more powerful than the human part, so the God part took over and basically his humanity disappeared. Well, that's their way of, of explaining away the paradox. But when they got finished ex dis explaining away the paradox, they explained away the truth about who Jesus is. And we do that. We as Christians often try to get rid of a paradox, and in, in doing so, we actually create a heresy. And one of the things I learned from going to graduate school and studying church history is every single heresy Christians came up with was the result of trying to explain away a paradox. When we try to explain away the mystery of something, we end up saying something that's no longer true. We reduce something to the parts. And that's what early Christians did with the Trinity. Let me explain. There was a guy named Arius. Uh, he, he created an entire council to deal with him. But Arius lived from 250 to 336, and he believed that God involved three distinct beings who did not share the same nature or essence. So Jesus is God, and the Father is God, and the Spirit is God, but they're all separate. They're distinct. And Jesus isn't God as much as the Father is God. Then there was Philipponus of Alexandria, who lived in the 6th century. He believed that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three gods who are distinct and separate. They're like friends hanging out. They're not one god. They're three gods. And then you have Sibelis. He lived around 215, and he said that God is one God, and the Trinity is really different masks or names for God, three different modes of expression. So there's only one God and only one person, but that one person reveals himself differently to different people at different times. Now, all of these people ultimately denied the essence of what the New Testament teaches about God. They tried to explain away a heresy, and the church had councils to deal with it. They developed creeds. In fact, in the 8th Athanasian Creed to deal with one of these, they said, the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God, and yet there are not three gods but one God. Um, it's, the Nicene Creed is one of my favorites. Here's the Nicene Creed. Um, listen to how wordy it is. It's so wordy because it's an attempt to, uh, to help Christians understand what they were confusing. It says, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made, who for us humans and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits on the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Well, that's a pretty wordy creed. And the reason that it was developed was to help Christians who are explaining away the paradox of the Trinity to accept it, that somehow there is one God 
in three separate but equal persons, which is really hard for our brain to get. The way I try to understand it is imagine a triangle. And in the middle of the triangle, you have God. The triangle is supposed to be a metaphor for God. And in one corner, you have Father, and another corner, Son, and another one, Holy Spirit. So the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Spirit is God. And then put is not along every line. The Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, and the Spirit is not the Father. So the Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit is God, and there's only one God. But the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Spirit, and the Spirit is not. That doesn't make any sense to me. Like, how is it possible that all are God, there's only one God, but they are not, they are not the same as each other? That's one way I understand it. Uh, C.S. Lewis had another illustration that he came up with. He said, imagine that you're in a two-dimensional universe and there are two squares talking to each other. And one square says to the other square, hey, I, I've heard about this thing that's six squares, but it's only one thing. And the other square says, well, if it's six squares, it's six things stuck together. It's not, si it's not one thing, it's six things. And the other square goes, no, 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 this thing is somehow one thing made up of six separate squares. And the other thing says, no, it's not possible. It's, it's got to be six things. Because in a two-dimensional universe, squares can imagine a three-dimensional universe where you have a cube. And a cube is six squares, but a cube is only one thing. Because it makes sense in a three-dimensional universe, even though it makes no sense in a two-dimensional universe. Well, if we can imagine three dimensions, God, in a sense, is beyond four dimensions. He's beyond our imagination. We can't grasp God. We accept that somehow God is one, and yet God is three in one. And that makes no sense to our pea brains, but God is beyond our understanding. And we just accept that. And people often say to me, well, David, what difference does it make if we believe in the Trinity? Even if we get this right, even if we grasp it on some level, what does it matter? Well, let me tell you two practical applications of the Trinity. Here's the first. It means that God is a community of lovers. Now think about that. There's one God in three equal persons. God is one in three. So when God is all by himself, he's never alone. God is somehow a community of persons. God didn't have to make us so he wouldn't be lonely. God has never been lonely. God didn't make us to keep him company. He made us so that he could share his love and community with us. That's mind-blowing. God shows us a picture of what community is supposed to be like because the Godhead is three in one, and yet there's submission among equals. The Son submits to the Father, even though the Son is equal to the Father. That means in community, there's submission among equals. And that means that leadership and submission has nothing to do with some people being more important than others. Even within the Godhead, there's submission among equals. And that should be the case in marriage. That should be the case in the church. We should have submission among equals. We should look to God as an example of what true community really looks like. That's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say is you need the Trinity to understand how to do the Christian life. We only understand things like salvation and prayer when we recognize the Trinitarian nature of God. You know, I heard about this occupational therapist who after becoming a follower of Jesus realized that the Trinity fulfills three basic human needs. Listen to this. First of all, the Trinity gives us a point of reference and everyone needs a point of reference. We know who we are through God the Father who created us in his image and adopted us as his kids. We have a point of reference. The second thing we have with the Trinity is a role model. Everyone needs a role model. We know what it looks like to fully love God and love people through the life and the passion of Jesus, the Son of God. He is our supreme example, and he's our inspiration for living life. So we have a built-in role model in the Trinity. And the third thing we have is a facilitator. We have a built-in encourager who gives us both the desire and power to think and speak and respond like Jesus. He builds us up when we get discouraged or get off course, and he challenges us us to do the right thing no matter the cost. That's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a built-in facilitator who helps us actually live out the Christian life. So all three persons of the Trinity actually fulfill deep needs in who we are. And that's important for us to understand. But I will say this, at the end of the day, 
The Trinity is beyond comprehension. Even if, if the cube talk helps you, uh, even if somehow uh, the, the triangle diagram uh, helps you grasp this concept, if you think about it more deeply, you'll realize it's still a paradox. It still doesn't make sense. You can't reduce it to something you can wrap your mind around. It's beyond our comprehension because God is beyond our comprehension. But that doesn't mean it's okay not to look at this concept. And it's certainly not okay to deny this concept. The nature of God is not adi afra. It's an essential of our faith.